Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal. We will dissect executive function into bite-sized chunks, and we will discuss how to become more proficient, how to get, gain knowledge about self, and how do we strategize to lead a successful life where we have uh, all the uh, information we need about self. And uh, maybe we can even take uh, some time to understand why we do things the way we do, what are the roadblocks. And so today's episode is going to be another fantastic episode because I have somebody very special all the way from Australia and his area of expertise is something um, every single person uh, is going to find very, very useful because he's going to talk about anxiety. So let's think a little bit about anxiety. I think all of us suffer from anxiety and maybe some people, I call it diagnosed versus undiagnosed. So, um, and, and the question is, is anxiety essential? Why does anxiety exist? And why some of us are paralyzed by the fear or incredible stress uh, that we experience every day uh, in everyday life? So uh, with that, uh, let me welcome Dr. Um, Ron Rapay. He is a distinguished professor of psychology from Macquarie um, University in Australia, and he is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and the founding director of the Center for Emotional Health. He has a background in clinical psychology, especially um, the understanding and development of mental disorders. His work specializes in developing treatment programs and evaluating their efficacy through cl cl clinical trials. Uh, foremost among uh, these has been the Cool Kids uh, suite of programs, which I'm so excited to talk to him about. Um, and they have uh, been introduced in 25 languages and used over uh, in over 30 countries. Uh, his research interests are anxiety, depression, related disorders across lifespan, uh, development of risk factors for internalizing distress, uh, prevention of uh, internalizing disorders and treatment for anxiety and related disorders. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Rapay, to the program. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Well, it's it's my pleasure. And let me get started with um, I ask all of this question of all of my guests since the topic is of executive function, insight, uh, self management, and and having this metacognitive awareness of who am I as a learner and thinker. And what are the obstacles that I face that uh, affects my being in the world? So since you specialize in anxiety, um, at what age or when did you become aware of your strengths and weaknesses? Did, do you struggle with anxiety? And what got you interested in the subject of anxiety? Wow, that's a, a lot of questions. Uh, when did I become aware of my, I guess, uh, awareness, self-awareness really begins very, very early in life. And so I'm sure um, I was like everyone else and probably started to become aware of myself uh, really from infancy to in some simple way. And then uh, self-awareness uh, would have increased after that. But of course, I can't remember. I I'd have no idea when I first became <laughs> aware of myself as a, as a thinking, uh, acting human being, because it's, it's such a subtle, slow process we wouldn't have Truly. a clue. Um, uh, what got you interested in anxiety? Uh, look, I, I partly it was serendipity. I mean, I'm, uh, I guess people who know me would say I'm, I'm probably a, a shy, reserved sort of person. I, I'm not, I don't think I suffer particular uh, anxiety disorders, but uh, look, I'm on the, ang on the higher side um, of, of anxious personality style, perhaps. So no doubt it resonates with me. Um, but my actual um, entry to anxiety uh, as a researcher was purely accidental. Um, really? I was actually interested uh, when I finished my undergraduate studies and was, was going to do a PhD, um, there was a famous professor 
um, at our university at the time, Sid Loverbond was his name, and he was very well known in the area of uh, alcohol abuse, and in particular in control, the idea of using, uh, of getting people who are addicted to alcohol and teaching them to drink normally, what used to be called controlled drinking. And it was very popular um, back in the um, or 70s, 80s, um, a very popular movement. Uh, and, and I was fascinated by that, and I really wanted to work in that field. Uh, and just at that time, there had accidentally, there had been um, a, a case, and I don't remember all the details, but a very famous case where some behavioural people, I think in America and Canada, um, had taken some very, very seriously ill alcoholics and had so, supposedly taught them to drink normally. And this was this huge sort of breakthrough and this huge demonstration. And then there had been a famous... Um, uh, incident where a few years later a researcher had gone back to their data, had followed those people up and discovered that actually all these people were in horrific states and, and many of them had died and it was just a shocking and, and there was sort of um, all sorts of comments about potentially they made up their data and things like that. So it, was, it had just blown up at the time when I walked in as this fresh-faced young kid to his professor's office saying, hey, I want to do something on <laughs> controlled drinking. He looked at me like I was an idiot and just said, not a chance. And he just happened to have a, a paper on his, on his desk on agoraphobia and he just picked it up and he threw it at me and said, here, do this. Really? And that was, I moved into anxiety. So it was purely accidental, um, but I think it does resonate. And, and I mean, you, you have a very, I've now watched many of your videos and, and you have a very calming presence. So uh, I am suspecting, I think your personal, uh, personal insights have influenced in a way that you don't look like you suffer from anxiety. So let's talk about anxiety. What is anxiety? How would you, um, is layman's understanding of worry when unmanaged uh, becoming anxiety, is that fair and uh, right way of describing anxiety? Well, worry is one component of anxiety, definitely. Uh, and it would be what we would refer to as the cognitive component. So worry is about threshing over um, possible scenarios in your mind, looking for possible dangers. And then in a sense, one of the best descriptions I think of worry is a, is a famous um, one many years ago of that it's failed problem solving. It's where oh, wow. people try to solve problems, but they, but they fail. They don't manage to do it properly. And so they keep rehashing and rehashing and thinking about them in different ways. And that's definitely a major component of worry, uh, of anxiety, sorry. But anxiety is more than that. Um, and from a scientific, but particularly from a clinical um, perspective, the component of, worry that, of anxiety that we often think about uh, is actually avoidance behavior. Most anxiety involves a tendency to try to escape, to try to get away from whatever it is that you're anxious about. And, uh, and so the core hallmark, uh, the core characteristic of anxiety is the desire to flee or to, or to avoid altogether. And that's really a critical aspect, which I think any lay person would recognize and, and accept, but we, as lay people, we don't normally talk about it in that way. So interesting. So uh, uh, bear with me as I uh, formulate some thoughts here. So feeling anxious is normal uh, and everybody experiences, uh, 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 typically, I mean, anxiety is a um, uncomfortable or, um, or undesired emotion or, or, or a response to something that's invoking this sense of bad outcome. Is it what we are trying to avoid? Yeah. So what is it? Is it conscious process? Is it uh, subconscious? It can be both. So it, uh, it probably involves both conscious, or, or I prefer to use aware and unaware processes. Yes, I love that. Conscious yes. always has a whole lot of uh, connotations around it, which is unfortunate. Um, but aware and unaware. So no doubt when we're anxious, there are a lot of unaware um, urges and, and, and desires and, and um, uh, motivations, uh, but a lot of it is aware as well. We are aware of what it is we're anxious about and we're aware of what it is we want to do about that. I think the, the hallmark definition of, of anxiety was the one pretty much what you said a minute ago, which is that anxiety is a response to a perceived threat or a perceived danger. And so that's really what it is. It is just about, it, it, it's, a, it's an emotion that comes up uh, in a person 
when they believe, or not only a person, sorry, in, in pretty much any organism, when that organism believes that it is in some imminent danger or threat. And it's, uh, as you said, because it's that sense of protecting one or, or emotion in response to a danger, it is normal. And that is extremely an important issue. That anxiety is very normal and it's more than normal, it's necessary. You've got to feel anxious in order to uh, survive. Um, when you have, um, I don't know, a cockroach running across a, a, a room uh, and the light suddenly comes on and that cockroach is suddenly in the, in the daylight or in, in the bright light, the cockroach becomes very anxious and that anxiety motivates a cockroach to run and to run quickly and to find shelter. And that keeps the cockroach alive. Now, if it didn't do that, it would sat there, someone would come along and step on it, so it would die. So anxiety is critical because it keeps us alive. That's so, so neat. Uh, thank you for kind of explaining it that way, because I think um, one uh, conventional wisdom commonly tells the term so loosely, uh, and we use it intermeshed with stress and anxiety as if it's everyday affair. Um, but what you're describing sounds to me, there is a way to distinguish a, a clinical threshold where it becomes a bare personal mental well-being. Um, there's, uh, I mean, so would you, uh, would you be open to the idea of healthy anxiety and unhealthy anxiety? Or do we say uh, essential anxiety and unessential anxiety? Uh, or is there a different way to understand when does it become a problematic uh, issue in somebody's life? I think what you've just said then is you've hit the nail right on the head that it becomes a clinical problem uh, and I guess unhealthy or, or um, uh, unnecessary anxiety are great terms. So uh, we, we <laughs> tend not to use those, but the, yeah, those are great, <laughs> great terms. Um, it's a clinical problem when it affects a person's life. So that is the difference. So uh, anxiety is normal. Everyone experiences anxiety and those people who don't experience anxiety uh, are probably in a bit of difficulty uh, in their lives. Everyone has to experience some anxiety to survive, as I said before. But where that anxiety becomes so persistent and affects a, per a, per a person in so many ways that it actually starts affecting their life and stopping them from reaching their potential or stopping them from doing the things they want or need to do, then it becomes a clinical disorder. So of course, when it's an extreme case, that's easy to decide. So when you've got a person who's so anxious that they don't leave the house, um, they stay inside all the time, they can't make relationships with other people, they can't hold a job, then it's clearly a problem and there's no question. However, when you have the gray areas where you have people who can do most of those things, but it's just those things are not up to their absolute maximum, it becomes a little harder to distinguish, but that is really the definition. And so what's so interesting is I think uh, because it's such a common place, people are not likely to seek help because they just think it's, oh, you're feeling anxious, calm down. And I bet that's like the worst advice you can give somebody is to calm down uh, because <laughs> it's, it's a, un, um, there's no understanding of what, what this message of worry or threat that person is feeling. And, um, uh, you know, Sapolsky talks about this, that in, in modern world, the threat is not the tiger or lion that's about to attack you, but these psychological threats of being misunderstood or being thought as incompetent or being perceived as a failure can be incredible threats, right? So how uh, do we understand? Yeah. So can you dive a little bit deeper into this perception of threat? What is causing uh, what do people fear about when they are fearing or th that invokes fear response in them? Yeah, look, that's a good question. I, I, I guess the, the list of possible threats is, is pretty much uh, limitless in, in terms of specific topics. Uh, but when we do factor analyses or fancy statistical techniques to divide things up into groups, when we try to group different types of fears. Interestingly, you do very, very broadly, at a very broad level, um, you find that fears tend to fall into two sort of broad groups. And one group are what you might refer to as physical fears. So that is the lion, the tiger, you know, the, the, the fear of a burglar attacking you, the fear of being raped, the fear of you know, being hurt, physically hurt in some way. And the other sort of fear is the more social, 
uh, type of fear. And those social fears include the sorts of things you're talking about, fear of failing, fear of being rejected, fear of not being understood, fear of uh, not, not succeeding. So there's more existential, but more sort of interpersonal types of fears. Mm. And if we think of all the different types of things in the world that can make us scared, very, very broadly, at a very broad abstraction, those are the two sort of broad categories, things that can physically hurt us or things that can um, emotionally or socially hurt us. Uh, so how does panic factor in this? Uh, where, where, is it on a spectrum? Is it, um, is it a time-related uh, res emotional response? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends very much on whether you're talking panic in lay terms or panic in a clinical scientific term. So what I mean by... Yeah, because when people, when most of us use the term panic, we, we're talking about extreme anxiety. So we're talking about anxiety in a way that suddenly just makes us um, it's more than it was than, than feeling anxious. It's a degree issue. And most of us just use the word panic to invoke that idea that it was very extreme. Hmm. And in that sense, we can think of panic as being sort of like a time issue. That is, when I'm anxious, I'm worried about some danger or some threat, as we we're saying before, but I'm worried about that danger or threat occurring at some point in the future. So if I'm anxious about losing my job, I'm not scared that I'm losing it this second. I'm scared that at some stage I will lose it. When you get, as that danger comes closer and closer in time, we start to get more and more and more anxious. And at some point we start saying, I'm panicking. And it's usually yeah. we're saying we're panicking when that danger is now. So when the lion is, is, you can hear it roaring in the distance, you're anxious. As you hear the roaring getting closer and closer, you get more and more and more scared. When you see the lion starting to run at you, you're panicking. And in that sense, that's a sort of a lay concept of the nature of um, that term, that emotion of panic. But we also, um, scientifically, there's another concept, which is panic attack or panic disorder. Hmm. Uh, and that's a DSM disorder. And when we talk about panic disorder, we're talking about people who have very specific set of fears. And those fears are very much physical. So typically people who have panic attacks and panic disorder are very worried. Their core fear is that they're going to die or have a heart attack or pass out. And so they're very much about physically related types of fears. Uh, and the fear is that uh, my heart's pounding and that because my heart's going to break through my chest and I'm going to die or something along those lines, or I can't uh, breathe, I'm feeling dizzy, I'm going to faint. And, and that's very much a physically focused type of disorder. And um, so I guess when we talk about treatment, maybe you can shed some light. Uh, I wanted to um, take a look at some... Uh, you, your work and uh, many researchers in this field talk about three core features of anxiety, um, you know, avoidance, negative beliefs, and physical symptoms. Uh, can you talk about the second part, the, the negative beliefs, uh, uh, kind of almost like a thought distortion, you would say? Um, so, right, is, that's also at the heart of anxiety? Very much so. So yeah, there's that, I guess we're talking a little bit before about the worry component. So there's that cognitive or mental component of worry, which is a, which is a very important part of it, which is all about those sort of uh, negative types of thoughts uh, about um, being unable to cope or being in some sort of danger. The, the distinction, most mental disorders have some mental components, but the distinction for anxiety is that, that those beliefs are still about danger. So that might be about, I am not going to succeed, or those people will laugh at me, or that um, uh, walking there is going to kill me, or, or getting in that car is going, I'm going to get hurt, or it's, it's something about, I am in some sort of danger. Hmm. And we know from a huge amount of research that people with anxiety disorders, that is people with clinical levels of anxiety, tend to hold those beliefs uh, in unrealistic ways. That is what we would often refer to as being biased or out of proportion to reality. So they will often, uh, if you ask a person with a clinical anxiety disorder, for example, how likely is it that you will get hurt? How likely is it that something bad will happen? The estimate that they give you is usually much higher than someone who doesn't have clinical anxiety. In other words, they tend to overestimate the degree of danger. Oh, wow. 
So, and, and that's measurable. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. David Burns, um, who has uh, done a lot of work in the cognitive behavior therapy, a particular team approach. Uh, and so talks about these 10 uh, patterns of cognitive distortions. Um, is that a common uh, understanding of these uh, st standard cognitive distortions that every person or some or um, many of these components that people experience? When they're experiencing anxiety disorder? Yeah, I think uh, for most, for, certainly for many of the, what we call uh, internalizing disorders or those disorders, particularly anxiety and depression, which are about ourselves, um, there is a strong cognitive distortion aspect to it. And there's a huge amount of research regularly demonstrating the fact that people with those um, very uh, emotional types of disorders tend to uh, be more extreme in their thinking. So in the case of anxiety, that people with anxiety tend to overestimate danger. Um, in the case of depression, people tend to um, overestimate the negativity or how bad things are and tend to focus on the negative. So there are clearly uh, many distortions. Dividing them into particular types and, and particular you know, numbers of types is really more an, an individual perspective. And I think that sort of thing is done much more for uh, the ability to, to communicate with the public. Um, and so um, David Burns comes up with the 10 types. Um, uh, Tim Beck, I can't remember how many types he had, but he had a number of different types as well. I think Albert Ellis had a number. They all have different numbers of types. Um, but that's really, those types are not necessarily scientifically demonstrated. It's more that they are a very, very useful way of helping people to understand the processes and helping to communicate that to, to patients and to help people get a, a handle on it. Well, we, when we look at it um, in terms of research, you tend to, again, find broadly two, two in anxiety at least, uh, I'm talking just anxiety, not depression, um, you tend to find two broad types of distortions. Uh, and so one, as I mentioned, is that overestimate of the probability of danger. That is, you tend to think I'm much more likely to get hurt or, or something bad is likely to happen much more so than it really does. The second type of distortion is a distortion of consequence. So anxious people tend to also overestimate how bad that bad thing will be. So to give you an example, if I'm, an, if I'm a socially anxious person um, and I'm uh, having this interview now, um, I might think it's extremely likely that I'm gonna say something stupid. Now, of course, the real, realistically, I could say something stupid and maybe I already have earlier on in this interview and that's realistic, but the chance that I'm very likely to say something stupid is probably an overestimate. So that's the difference between a clinically anxious person and not clinically anxious is that they might all say, everyone might say, I might say something stupid, um, but the clinically anxious person overestimates how likely that is. But secondly, the clinically anxious person also estimates how bad that will be. So the non-anxious people might say, yeah, look, I might say something stupid, but if I do, look, you know, probably no one will really notice. And if they do, they'll forget about it two minutes later and it doesn't really matter. Whereas the clinically anxious people would say, if I say something stupid, it's gonna be really terrible. It's the end of the world. My career is over. No one will ever take me seriously again. That's it, I'm done for. So that's why we talk about the two broad types. There's an overestimate of the likelihood that something will be bad and also an overestimate of how bad that will be. So helpful because I think um, um, one thought comes to my mind about children as we are helping and particularly adults, if they don't, they're not psych wise, if they don't have any psychological intuitions about how people think or behave, uh, let alone deeper understanding of the clinical uh, knowledge, a conventional wisdom just say, has this tendency of using aggression towards them and say, snap out of it, or you're being completely irrational or um, to yell at somebody for, why? Nobody's going to make fun of you. Look, I, I'm wearing big clothes. Nobody makes fun of me. You know, so there's like, like this, these often commonsensical encouragements that people give are so ineffective. And, and um, because it goes at the heart of this anxiety and, and even depression that people have this perceived notion of how one must overcome uh, these problems. So what do you think, why, why is it so difficult for a clinically anxious or clinically depressed person to 
snap out of things or find meaning uh, in advice that other people give? I think that speaks to the nature of mental disorders, which is that they are not voluntary. They are very involuntary way. They are, they are ways of thinking and ways of behaving, but they are involuntary and they're ingrained. Uh, they're often steeped in a strong background of personality style um, and the way the person deals with the world in general, combined with often uh, a very, very long history of behaving in that way. So when you have someone who, for example, with anxiety, has naturally has an anxious or withdrawn personality style, and on top of that, has acted in a clinically anxious way for maybe 20, 30, or 40 years, to suddenly just say to them, well, just snap out of it. Um, of course, they can't do that. Uh, it's to say, it would be the same as someone who's got a, um, a really sunny disposition and is happy all the time to say, well, just stop it, stop being happy. <laughs> that it, it just doesn't make sense. You can't just change a personality like that. You can change, and it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of time. It's not something you snap out of. I think you, you uh, hit on it before, a comment you made earlier also, um, was about that you really need to have, show some empathy towards the way people think. And the idea that anxiety is so normal and that everyone gets anxious to some degree, I think it makes it very hard for people then to empathize with extreme anxiety. Because most people say, I get anxious and I can deal with it. And so it's very hard for them to, to really empathize with someone who can't handle it or can't get on top of it. Um, but that's the, that's the critically important thing. Of course, everyone wants to be understood and everyone want, doesn't want to be told to do something different or to snap out of it, people want to have some recognition that what I'm experiencing is very real uh, and very difficult and that I don't want to do it. I think that's the other thing. Um, often, as you said, for parents, but even for, for partners or others, there's this sense of, oh, you're just being weak or you're being silly. And they're not. They're not trying to do it. They can't help it. It's the way that someone has learned to think and to behave. You know, I think um, I had another um, a wonderful researcher, Tim Pitchell, who studies um, procrastination. And uh, it was so interesting to me um, to, uh, to follow that uh, line of uh, thinking. And I see, um, or the relationship between anxiety and procrastination as a, um, as a behavior, out, outwardly observable behavior, uh, particularly if they are not showing these distortions where somebody's having a panic attack, but if they, you just see them stalling and not initiating. So I see in, in my work, I see a lot of procrastination. And so what is, uh, how do you see the, these two relate to each other? Well, they are very closely related. Uh, procrastination is, as, as you said, is an, is an end product behavior. Uh, it's an outward manifestation. And as a result, it's a complex behavior that could have a lot of different root causes. But in the majority of cases, uh, anxiety would be one of the fundamental um, causes uh, of procrastination. People tend to procrastinate often when they're feeling very socially anxious. That is a sense that I can't do it, I'm gonna fail, I'm not gonna be good enough, etc. Or when they're being very perfectionistic, a sense that it has to be done exactly so. And, uh, and, and I'm not going to make it. And so procrastination is often underpinned by fundamental worries and fundamental anxieties. And in a way, um, in fact, in a very real way, you can think of procrastination as being a type of avoidance behavior. So again, when we're exactly. saying a, anxiety involves um, worry components and it involves avoidance, procrastination involves often involves a worry component. I won't make it. I won't be good enough, etc. And then the result of that worry is often extreme avoidance where you just say, well, I'm going to go to the beach. <laughs> so how young um, a, a child can be uh, diagnosed with anxiety disorder? Um, and how would that manifest in children? Uh, does anxiety present itself differently at different ages? Yeah, you can see anxiety, uh, clinical levels and, and severe levels of anxiety occurring pretty much at any age. Uh, so really from, from two, three, four years of age, you can start to diagnose anxiety if you want. Now I say if you want, because when you're getting at that very young age to be putting labels on, on children 
can be controversial sometimes. In some cases, it can help if it gets them the help that they want, um, but uh, or they need. But in many cases, it you know it, it's not necessarily a, something people want to do. But certainly, you can see clinical levels of anxiety at, at preschool level um, from very young ages. As we were saying before, anxiety or any disorder really is about a normal type of process that has gotten to such a point where it's interfering with or, ex or, or affecting your life. Clearly, the younger a child is, the harder it is to actually affect your life because younger children depend on their parents more. Um, Two-year-old or three-year-old doesn't really have to achieve a great deal. Um, and so you don't, you don't tend to see anxiety interfering a huge amount at that young age. So you see much less examples of, uh, of clinical anxiety. And then as kids get older, that, those clinical levels of anxiety start to increase uh, in frequency because there's more opportunity for interference and impact. Mm. You know, I, I, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to answer the second part, but uh, about you asking about different types of anxiety oh, yes. at different ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Please, so yeah, yeah the, the nature of anxiety also tends to change across time. So early in life, um, you tend to see, for example, things like uh, separation fears, separation anxiety being, mm. extra, of course, the most common form of anxiety, a fear of separating from parents. And just naturally with development, that decreases and you get very, very little separation ang anxiety by about adolescence and onwards. Um, on the other hand, social anxiety, you tend to find a, an increase in that across childhood. You can see a lot of social anxiety in young children, but it increases and you're more likely to find social anxiety disorder beginning around about early adolescence, around 12, 13 years of age. Um, gen more broad based generalized types of anxiety, what we refer to as generalized anxiety disorder, you tend to find that increasing more across adolescence uh, and being much more likely later on. Um, whereas things like uh, more physical fears like panic disorder, where people are worrying about heart attacks, you tend to find that occurring much more commonly after adolescence and, and into the early 20s. So those patterns of anxiety, different types of anxieties do occur at quite, quite different stages of life. I think uh, to me also what makes sense about what you just described, the progression, more you know to fear then your fear grows, you know, <laughs> as you have more world experiences, you have more things to be afraid of. Uh, well, it certainly becomes more um, generalized. Yes, it becomes more... Pervades um, all aspects of life. Yeah, more existential, perhaps, is the, yes. is the way of thinking about it. That when you're younger, uh, you get, for example, um, you get separation fears, but also um, phobias of dogs and the dark and ghosts. So when you're younger, it's much more concrete things you're worried about. And as you get older, when you get into teenage, of course, it's more social things because teenagers are worried about their peers and social interactions. And then when you get older still, it becomes perhaps more existential issues, death and taxes and <laughs> various issues like that. And then, of course, the good news that I didn't um, touch on, the, the great news is that, that after you get to about your 50s uh, or so, your anxiety disorders actually start to decrease. Wow. And we find a dramatic decrease of anxiety disorders in older age. You can still find anxiety disorders. So we still need treatments for older people, um, but they're much less common. And, uh, and most people will say they get less anxious once they get into their older age. Is that because they have less expectations or they have less um, stakes, less things at stakes? We have we no know. idea. We don't know. It's one of those really amazing questions. It's a, it's a fact. We know it's there. Uh, epidemiological study after study shows that prevalence of anxiety disorders uh, and mood disorders, but anxiety disorders decreases in older age. Um, but the reasons for that, people have looked at all sorts of possibilities, um, uh, coping strategies, uh, emotional reactivity, uh, as you say, ex existential sorts of views of the world, experience, all those things might be the case but no one's come up with a good answer. It's, it's a fascinating uh, issue. It's, it's so funny you s said about... ...patient teacher training uh, for two years. It's going to last for two years. I'm just in the beginning stages of it. And um, we have, I mean, since everything after the pandemic has gone in the virtual world, they are, we do follow-up class, uh, like, meditation practices and any questions you might have 
and there are like 50 to 100 people on a call at a time. And then when people are given an opportunity to um, do a check-in or describe what they're um, feeling, 99% of people are anxious about dying in this, with the coronavirus. And, um, and of course, uh, I'm, maybe this is um, more awkward on my part, but I have no fear about coronavirus, actually. I mean, partly growing up in India with, with lots of, you know, cholera and, and all kinds of diseases, um, you know, plague and uh, not plague maybe, but uh, I think it's just so interesting that I was surprised uh, um, with hearing so many people talking about their fears and, and not be able to process this sudden onset of new, something to intangible to worry about. So are you noticing yeah. or is your work, are you inundated with more work in this pandemic? Has that shifted people's relationship to anticipated fears or outcomes, negative outcomes? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, the, the short answer is no, we haven't, I, I haven't seen anything, partly because uh, these days I work primarily with children and young people oh, um, and not with adults. And so that existential type fear of, particularly fears of death, um, as much less in children anyway. Children don't worry as much as they shouldn't uh, about dying. Uh, but also, of course, coronavirus doesn't affect them uh, in the same way uh, at all. But I wonder if part of it is also a, uh, a country difference. Um, Australia very luckily, well, luckily and, and um, due to engineering, um, perhaps uh, we haven't really been affected by corona very much. Uh, currently, I think we in my state of New South Wales, we're having about two or three new cases a day. Um, so it's not something it, people- Top of uh, the mind for people. Yeah, that's right. It is very much top of the mind, uh, but I think the reactions are much more to do with mood and depression because of the treatment, the cure, that is the lockdown. I see. I'm not sure how much of that you got, but um, I think- Say that the, again, sorry, that part. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the issues in Australia are much more around boredom and depression and the mood effects because oh, of the lockdowns and the effects of corona because we have to stay home, we're isolated, we can't do I those see. things. So those are the impacts. But anxiety is not an issue for people because we all know the chance of getting sick with corona is extremely tiny. Um, and even if we did get it, um, we have almost no deaths. And so that's, so that's not an issue. So there's probably a country difference. Um, but also I think uh, there are certainly age differences. Well, we can't, uh, I know we, we have been talking a lot, but let's talk about your wonderful book and all the research you have done, but those who haven't um, uh, had a chance yet, but I want, I highly encourage all of you to get this book, Helping Your Anxious Child. Um, it's step-by-step -step guide for parents. And Dr. Rapay is a, a main author. He's co-written this with many others. Uh, tell us about, uh, you bring message of hope. So I'm so excited to know that there's something we can do. Um, so talk about cool kids and particularly this approach um, uh, to managing anxiety. Right. Well, yes, look, I think our conversation has been fabulous so far, but it's been very much focused on, on adults, I guess, and, and the bigger picture. Um, and so that just to say that uh, anxiety disorders, clinical levels of anxiety can occur in children, uh, and it affects pr around about 5% um, or so um, of people, uh, of young people um, between about uh, 7 and 17 um, it increases slightly in adolescence. And so many young people do have clinical levels of anxiety. And, and the treatments we offer are actually very similar to the treatments we, we offer to adults. It's really uh, what you might refer to as a cognitive behavioral um, uh, approach, which is that we teach um, uh, children, young people, how to think differently uh, about their fears and worries, how to approach their, uh, their feared outcomes uh, in a different way. Uh, and we teach them that the critical issue is we teach them to gradually not avoid, to gradually face their fears, to get out and to do the things they're afraid of. Their parents have a critical role um, in this. And I think that's clearly the difference between working with children and working with, um, uh, with older people is that with the children, we have the parents uh, involved. And so the parents have a key role to play um, where they really act in some ways as the sort of co-therapist and the parent helps their child along the way with the process. 
the parent helps their child engage in activities. The parent provides rewards for the child. Um, we also teach the parents way, different ways of interacting with their child. So they're not getting quite as caught up with their child's problem, but they're able to take a step back and in that way provide more help for the child being, having a, bit, a slightly more dispassionate um, uh, approach. And so we find, and we find that it works incredibly well. We get um, at the end of treatment, our usual treatment goes for about uh, three months. And at the end of that time, we find about 60% of young people uh, are free of their main uh, presenting problem. And over the next sort of three to six months, we find that number goes up to about 75%. So, so once That's we've finished uh, the Cool Kids program, we found, find about three out of four kids are completely free of their main uh, anxiety disorder, which, which is a pretty good outcome. That's phenomenal. So can you walk us uh, through some of the, uh, what would that might look like for a parent uh, working with a child? And what's so interesting, um, I was uh, in preparation for your, um, this interview, I was reading some research about parents' anxiety, and there was a, well, one particular group that studied um, math anxiety of parents, and parents who themselves had math anxiety, and if they were helping their children, their children had negative outcomes. But if the parents had math anxiety but did not help with the homework, the children were actually safe. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, a, there's a way to influence, because that emotional contagion, you can feel extremely anxious if the person is anxious that you are with, right? So what, what you're talking about this dis dispassionate, is that a sense of equanimity? Uh, is that taking control of your own emotions? How does that look like? Yeah, we, that first of all, we know that anxiety runs in families. There's no question. There is a strong genetic component and that relates back to the, that personality style I was talking about earlier. There is no doubt that there is something that is passed on. And so we do find that anxious children tend to have slightly more anxious parents doesn't mean the parents have a clinical disorder at all. They might be very, very high functioning, fabulous parents, not a, not a problem, but they're more likely to be at that anxious end of the spectrum. Uh, and so what we do tend to find in, in a lot of our work is that the parents, when you have a child who is highly um, temperamentally anxious and a withdrawn nervous type of child, often going way back to the day they're born, um, they get it, the parents and the child that can often get into a sort of a, a cycle, a pattern where the child um, gets anxious a lot, cries a lot, gets distressed a lot. So of course, as a loving, caring parent, what do you do? You, you go and you help them. And then you very quickly learn that, oh, my child's going to get upset, so I better help them. And you start getting into this cycle where you're leaping in more and more quickly to the child's defense. And so what happens then? Well, a child is not learning to cope. A child is not learning to deal with life themselves because every time they try and do something, the parent is there helping them. And so you have this, this cycle. It's not the parent's fault, but it's a habit or a pattern that they've gotten into as a couple where the child gets upset, the parent leaps in and helps, and then the child doesn't learn that I can do it and gets more upset in future. And so part of what we do in the program is teaching parents to take that step back, to, to start to tell themselves, my child can do this, they're perfectly capable and I don't need to help my child here. And giving the child a chance to make their own mistakes is, is the type of lesson we try to, to, to get them to learn. And you know, one very important component of that is that incredible tolerance for somebody's mistakes. Uh, you know, <laughs> because mm. uh, another uh, spectrum that I see uh, that the, the, the parents desire to help or step in is to really not offer respite to the child from the, or rid their anxiety, but their own uh, expectation of perfection from their children or unending expectations of excellence, which is just not possible by definition, child is learning, you know? So uh, sounds like, uh, do you do any, um, do you see any difference in affluent versus non-affluent communities in terms of the level of anxiety? Um, I had had an opportunity to um, um, interview Sunia Luther. Uh, she's a researcher here, a social psychologist, and she found in affluent communities there were more stresses about this invisible kind of wall that they have to all climb. And parents were doing uh, going above and beyond trying to 
um, get their children market ready, so to speak, you know? And, and mm. so there's like a generalized anxiety in the communities, not just a family. <laughs> so the kind of school you belong to, everybody wants to yell or fail kind of mindset, you know? So do you see yeah. any difference that way? Not really. One of the really interesting things about anxiety, clinical anxiety disorders, is that it is really non-discriminatory. It affects uh, all races, it affects all levels of society, it affects all different types of people, um, pretty much equivalently. Um, mental health problems in general are more common in the lower socioeconomic groups, and so people who are struggling um, with life's stresses um, are slightly more likely to have anxiety problems, but it's really um, much, much less of a difference, much less of a difference than problems like depression, for example, which is much more strongly linked to socioeconomic level. Anxiety affects uh, all levels of society pretty much the same. Um, and that's one of the fascinating things about it. It's very hard for us to find causes or to find predictors because it's pretty much um, universal. You know, I, I've been thinking about, um, now I'm forgetting his name, but there was a, a one, wonderful author and a comedian and an actor who spoke about his childhood and he uh, describes this whole family was a little neurotic, uh, you know, they had, and a little bit, as you said, you know, shy, nervous, awkward, weird, but the parents were so nurturing they kind of identified and recognized this child's quirky behaviors. And what they did is they converted his bedroom, entire bedroom into this amazing theater and with drop down curtains and, and this very odd kid, kid who would perform plays and had, ha, have uh, um, you know, shows on his bed and, and the only audience member would be his aunt, you know, something like that. But if eventually he became this very celebrated. Now I can't think of his name. I was trying to look for the name of his book. But what was so beautiful about that to me is the, kid, the parents never tried to do anything to change him. They actually created a workaround and, and empowered him uh, to, to find a true meaning in his awkwardness. And, and I think that's such a wonderful way to live a life where we can't be perfect and particularly we can't be some ways that other people want us to be. And, and anxiety can really do a number on us because it's all uh, the kind of expectations uh, the world and we ourselves have. So as we come to a uh, close, uh, do you have any parting thoughts? What's the most inspiring thing you have learned about anxiety? I think the most... Uh... <laughs> The main thing to remember is, is that anxiety is normal, that anxiety can be really important. Uh, it can motivate us to great things. We need some level of anxiety to get us to get out of bed in the morning and get going. It's about keeping it under control and not letting it dominate your life. Well, thank you, Dr. Rappé, for being here with us and for your wisdom and your knowledge. As we part away, do you recommend any books, uh, any your favorite, all-time favorite books um, that you might re recommend to our audience? <clears throat> well, I wish you'd asked me that before so I could think about it. Um... Okay, we can pause and you can take a minute and I can stitch it together. Do you have a recommendation? No, I'm, I'm thinking for some reason, The Kite Runner um, jumps I into my that. mind. That was fabulous. I love that book. Um, but yes, look, um, there are many, many Jonathan Friends, and I loved a lot of those books. Uh, look, um, any yeah, anxiety yeah. researcher that you admire? Anxiety. Um, my colleagues will all shoot me now, but uh, oh, sorry. I, I, I must say, I never, I very rarely, if ever, read anxiety books because um, really? I, read, I read scientific papers. I, I don't tend to read the sort of the the whole book type aspect. Yeah, did clearly, you ever I mean, read my, Joseph Ledoux's book on anxiety I, or anxious? I didn't. No, I should. I should because Very it, when people talk about it, I've read his papers. Yeah, I, I read scientific papers. I tend not to read books. Um, I have to probably put a plug in for my old um, uh, yes. mentor and supervisor, David Barlow. Um, Wonderful, who's, yes. Who's, of course, he's written the, the volume on anxiety disorders. Which one? Uh, so that, um, anxiety and its disorders, it's called. Perfect. Well, we will plug that into our uh, show notes. And thank you once again for being here. Everyone, please stay tuned for, stay tuned for our next episode. And if you love what you heard, uh, recommend it to your friends. 
I bet you know a lot of anxious people who will benefit from this conversation. So uh, remember, be brave, be bold, and uh, know more about yourself. So thank you, Dr. Rapay, for being with us today. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thanks, Sushita. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.